You may be seated. I want to share something with you before I turn the service over to, to Farrell. Um, Robin alluded to it a little bit, but about football season, tomorrow night is the national championship um, football for college. And um, I want to read, share something with you that's been on my mind um, about a couple guys that I work with, how involved they are with their sports teams. And um, about the, all the work and stuff that they put in. But I just, and then when I look at um, my relationship with Christ, I want to want to read something to you and just, we've got to figure out where we are. It says some sports teams have a variety of types of fans, okay? It's a different variety. Some are casual fans. They support the team only because they live in the city where the team is, and they're satisfied to know what the score of the game is, but not interested in actually watching the game. They don't put a lot of time into the team, you know, so they're just casual fans. Then we have committed fans, okay? The committed fans, they make sure they watch the game. Um, they keep up with how the team is doing. They know the score. Um, they know what the team record is, who the team is playing next. And they get very emotional and involved in the game. They cheer when a touchdown is scored or a spectacular play is made. They get upset and shake their heads and do all kinds of stuff when the game isn't going in their favor. They're not casual. They're committed to their team, good or bad. So we've got casual fans. We've got committed fans. Then you have fanatics, okay? Then you have the fanatics. The fanatic fans, they'll miss church to watch a game. The fanatic fan keeps up with statistics of the team. They can give detailed information of what the team is doing um, or what they did after the game. They'll turn on ESPN, Sports Center, you name it, to review what they've actually already watched. They'll look at social media and find out what people are even saying about their team. They'll argue with you if you have a difference of opinion about their team. It's because they're fanatical about their relationship relative to their team. So we've determined that we sports teams have different types of um, fans, right? Christ has different types of Christians. Christ has different types of Christians. He has casual Christians. We've accepted Christ at some point in our lives. We will reference him occasionally. We say grace before we eat, and we pray before we go to bed. We make sure we don't miss out at special events at church, and we will do just the minimum to show that we know of Jesus, okay? Then some of us are committed Christians, okay? We're the faithful church goers who want to know about what God says. We bring our Bibles to church. We want to understand scripture. And we ask questions, lots of questions about scripture. We have regular devotion and we have serious conversation with God. And we always seek to have God in special elements of things in our life. We take Christianity a little bit more seriously than the casual Christian, okay? Then we have the fanatical Christians, okay? We have the fanatics. These are the individuals who are crazy about Jesus. They talk to you about Jesus when you don't want to hear about Jesus. There are people who are not ashamed to be publicly identified with Christ. They will consistently witness to non-believers. They will correct the believers who they think are getting out of line. These individuals are overwhelmed by their love for Jesus, and it shows all over the place in their lives. Sometimes these people will get on your nerves because all they want to do is talk about Jesus. 
But what we've got to understand, church, is God knows this and understands that what? Not all believers are what? Equally committed, okay? All of us aren't equally committed. So I challenge you, I ask you, where are you? Are you a casual Christian? Are you a committed Christian? Or are you a fanatic? You know, God knows. Wherever you are, I challenge you to move one step closer. 2024, I think God has some, some tremendous things for Samaria Baptist Church. But I also think he's got some tremendous things for you as an individual. I don't know what that looks like. You may not know what that looks like, but God does. But I challenge you, take the next step. Wow, that's good, Darren. Um, you know, the closer or the older I get, I guess, in my walk with the Lord and in reference to the gospel, you know, um, I'm overwhelmed what Christ did for me. You know, as he came and was born, I shared in a message in Nicaragua just a while back about how Christ came and was born in Bethlehem. He actually born where the sheep would be born that were sacrificed, you know, and he did that for us, and um, I'm thankful. So as I, I really think, as you, as you move to the fanatical is when you really realize what Christ did for you, and you're overwhelmed, and you can't do nothing but share him with others, right? I, I, I'm so glad to be with you guys. I'm all, this is always my first stop when I come back to the States, and Happy New Year. I'm still in 2023, though. I keep saying next year we're, gonna, it's, we're here already. It, it just goes by so fast, doesn't it? It seems like you start a year, and then the next thing you know, it's over. And we were so blessed last year in ministry. I'll share a few things that we were able to do. We began a cosmetology program for girls or guys, anybody that wanted to learn how to cut hair or do cosmetology. We had about, I think, 10 15 women in that. A girl from uh, North Carolina came down, was there three months, and she came and taught that as a class. Uh, we offered vocational uh, classes through our sew sewing program to about 39 different women. Uh, we had a class where they learned how to do nails and stuff. I'm still trying to get them to do my feet, but they won't do it. But, <laughs> but uh, we, we did uh, that. We distributed book bags and school supplies to over 540 kids in our tutoring program. Um, we distributed 3,800 packs of food at our senior citizen program. And it's packs of food that in the pack, it's a manna pack, and it has all the nutrients they need in that pack of food, and it has seven meals in that one pack. So you could get all the nutrients you need for that day and be, uh, and within that, that's 72,800 meals that were given away. Uh, we provided 107,600 prepared hot meals to people. Um, we distributed food to hundreds of needy families. When mission teams come down, uh, we prepare packs of food that would last them maybe for a week or two weeks and we take it to the families uh, that our staff has identified that are needy, and we're able to pray with that family, share the love of Jesus, and give them food. And uh, we, I don't even know how many. It was incredible. Every time we do it, it was at least 10 families or more. Uh, we built 56 bunk beds. That's 112 children now have a bed to sleep in. And that's an incredible program as well. And it's always fun. I mean, we're going into houses and some of the houses, the bed almost touches the ceiling, and it's, it just barely fits in the house. But the children get in these beds, and they're smiling, and they're just so happy in the joy you see. Uh, one lady told me one time, she said, the only problem is I can't get my children to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> so I'm that way too sometimes, right? 
uh, we enrolled over 60 students in the Mark Kasky Bible Institute, and we started this three years ago uh, with, the, with the goal of training pastors and leaders in Nicaragua. Um, there is a lot of pastors uh, have no formal education, and so a lot of times they, their, their theology is really manipulated or created by missionaries who come and present the wrong gospel. And so there's a lot of prosperity gospel that's being preached in Nicaragua. And the problem with it is they're telling people, you know, God wants to bless you. And, he, and it's true, God does want to bless us. But we can't just name it and claim it, you know. And so these people who are so poor, of course they want a house. Of course they want food. Of course they want... And so they start praying or declaring these things, and it doesn't happen. And then the people say, well, why does God hate me? Why does God, is he angry with me? And so we're trying to show them a biblical perspective of, of what the gospel is, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the hope he gives us. So uh, let's think, cut off again. Uh, and so uh, we... We'll start our fourth year. It'll be, there'll be a four-year school, and we're hoping to see um, uh, an enrollment increase. We have a lot of pastors that are want, interested in coming now, and, uh, and we have lay leaders and regular people come too, uh, and it's, it's a great program. We constructed a house last year. We finally finished. Uh, we offered eight scholarships through the William Minor Scholarship Program, or eight kids that have come through our program are now in college. They're studying to be marketing, a computer science. It's just incredible to see children who couldn't read or write, never went to school, are now in college, and uh, it's just a blessing. Uh, we provided vocational training to six young men. Um, we had about 18 high school students take electrical wiring classes, learning how to be electricians, and uh, that's, a, that's a great program as well. And then we provided uh, assistance, medical assistance to people through our Hope Clinic, and we hosted 13 mission teams and interns. Uh, so it's been a busy year, and we've seen God do incredible things. As I share with you this morning, um, I was, I was looking over, I always reflect as we end a year and begin another year, I was looking over those things. And, and I, I, really, I really wanted to find our purpose, my purpose, but also what the church's pur purpose should be. As we go into a, an election year, I was talking to somebody last night and they said, oh man, I'm dreading 24 here because we got an election and it's already a mess and I'm afraid what's going to happen and I, you know, and... Uh, as we looked in our Sunday school class this morning, Psalms 91, we don't have to worry about what's going to happen. We shouldn't be already predict or getting worked up about what's going to happen because when we're under the shelter of the Most High, we don't have to worry because He takes care of everything, and we don't have to be worked up. But what is our purpose? I, I know a while back um, it was said that a lost world may not see God but they can see the church. You know, there's people today that will never step a door, a, a, a step in the church, but they can see you, and they can look at how you live your life and how you respond. I also want to thank Raul and, and Steve for being with me. They were, Raul's my driver. He drove me up here in the rain yesterday. No, uh, I'm thankful they're here with me. But a lost world may not see God, but they can see the church. So what is our purpose? What should be our focus? And who is the church? Is the church the building? A church an organization? No, it's people. It's you and I. We are the church. So when people see how we live our lives, it can transform. And the gospel is produced or proclaimed to them. And they can respond and see that there is hope in Jesus Christ. The truly, I think the scandal of the church is that while we're getting stuffed here with programs and, and how to be better and how to do this better, and how, there's people that are dying without the gospel who are going to live in eternity in a place called hell. And that's why I am where I'm at. God uh, never, never could have predicted 
I would be living in Nicaragua. Uh, I still am, my Spanish is getting better, but, you know, it's still, I, I murder it every day, you know. I, I'm, I should have... I should have really paid attention in high school, but I didn't, you know, so, uh, but, so I would have never predicted I would be in a, a Spanish, another country, and, and not even know the language, um, but 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says, by this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believe in vain, we, we need to understand that we have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That's, our, that's how we have gotten to where we're at. And it's only by the gospel that you can be born again, to understand that you're a sinner, to understand that without Christ, you have no hope in the future. When we go to homes in Nicaragua, you know, we can pass out food all day long. I can give physical help to people. But if they don't know Christ, the greatest tragedy that they'll ever have is that they'll die without Christ, without hope of eternity. And so the first thing we need to realize, I think, as a church, is that we've been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a glorious gospel. Jesus, or John says in 1 John 3 verse 1, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children and that is what we are. We are the children of God. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that, that we are God's children because they don't know him. And so we have been saved by the love of God, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Why? So that you and I could have a relationship restored that we could experience salvation through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and be forgiven and have that relationship reestablished. So we need to remember that we have been saved by the gospel. Uh, I always share this passage of scripture with mission teams because if you look down further in John, 1 John 3, there's six, verses 16 through 19. We see that this love that we've experienced, the love of the Father, now has, requires responsibility. It says, we know, that we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth, so we will be confident when we stand before God. Why do we love? Why should we share the gospel? Because we have experienced the love of God. And it's no good just to say, well, God loves you. God loves you. And we turn and walk away. We have to respond to the needs of others. We can't, just, it's, we can't just think that's enough when we say, God bless you. And that we know that person has a need in their life. And we say, well, see you later. Um, Francis of Assisi said this, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Right? I didn't really understand that growing up. Okay. Because I, I came to church, I participated in church, I taught Sunday school even as an adult and was in the youth program. But I really never really understood what it meant to really live out the gospel of Jesus Christ until I got to meet a young boy. And if we show that first picture, his name was Chepe. This is a young boy right here. His name's Chepe. His real name's Jos Jose. Josue, excuse me. Josue. But I, I found out about this community the first year I was in Nicaragua. And I went up to this community, and we, we wanted to start really moving our program up there because that's where these children were from. And Chappie was 11 years old in that picture. 
And he was horrible. I hated that kid. That kid would run up and slap me in the back of the head and run off. And I'm like, you come back here. You know, and we tried to show a movie one night. And he was running into church, snatching the chairs out underneath the girls and dumping them on the floor. And I said, you little turd, let me get hold of you. But he was always doing something to get my attention. And I didn't realize that. If you'll show the next picture, we had a vacation Bible school. And I mean, Cheppy was a poor kid. He had, he would come to the vacation Bible school in shirt, it would be filthy. His pants had holes, shirt had holes in it. His shoes, I mean, they were wore out. They were like flip flops, barely, barely, really thin. And, um, but he came to vacation Bible school, and again, he was just out of control. We couldn't control him. And this picture you see here, um, he's the one in the blue and white. The day before that picture was taken, he came to church, and they gave the gospel, and he heard it. They actually did a play. And after the play was over, they gave an invitation, and he was the first one to the front of the church. I mean, we're talking about a little bitty building, too. He was the first one there. The next day, we had uh, this last activity. And Chepe came. I was there at 8 o'clock. We were setting up the chairs, sweeping out the building. And he showed up with that blue and white shirt on, collared shirt. He had on these, the best pants he had. And they still had filthy, dirty, and holes in them. I said, what are you doing here so early, Chappie? He said, I came to set up. And I remember telling Raul that day, I said, that's what the gospel does. Transformation. He's got the very best clothes he could find on. Nobody told him to do that. And he came in and made that little cross. And Chappie, after that, I'm going to show you his story. If we'll play that first video. Crecí en, en el, aquí en Matagalpa. Y sé, tengo, somos cuatro hermanos. La, dos hermanos viven en Managua y dos estamos aquí. Que el papá, el otro papá mío se los llevó. Es que somos de los cuatro, somos el mismo papá. Él se los llevó. Yo no sé dónde vive mi hermana, no sé. En la casa nadie me ayuda, nadie, nadie. Yo mismo tengo que lavar la ropa, nadie me la lava. Entonces, por ahí van mal. Este, me, ahí en la casa me maltratan. Dicen que soy un drogadicto. Es la verdad, pero yo no me friento que soy droga. Ya tengo dos años. Sí, me hace difícil, pero ¿por dónde voy a darle? Ahora, gracias a Dios, ya no me falta, ya me salí de eso. El mejor momento era cuando tenía a mi mamá vida. Cuando mi mamá ya se fue de este mundo, comenzaron a decirme drogadicto, todo esto y otro. Entonces, por ahí va mal. Me corren de la casa, como que no me quieren. Entonces, no hay por dónde darle. Le voy a ser sincero. Mi mamá cuando tenía el primer hombre, le daba mal vi mala vida. Entonces se fue con otro y le hicieron mal. La mujer de ella, del otro, mi papá. Le hizo mal aquí, vino a morir. Ya tiene tres meses de muerta. Y a mí eso me hace sentir mal. 
Usted sabe que con su madre puede hacer todo uno, pero... ¿Qué le vamos a hacer? Sí, me hace falta, pero ni modo, ¿qué le voy a hacer? ¿Qué le vamos a hacer si la si mamá no está en este mundo? Ya que mi mamá no está, ahora pienso buscar de Dios. Así fue, conforme de Dios, salirme de eso. Mi mejor sueño es ser un delicenciado. Solo sometiéndome a Dios, puedo cumplirlo. Pero si no, uno si no le dice así, no, 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 no sale. Que siga adelante las cosas de Dios, todo eso, que no siga mal aviso, seguir adelante. Y lo puedo lograr. That video was made in 2015. It wasn't long after that that Chepe um, got involved in drugs. Uh, he even stole from us. He's probably stolen more things from me than anybody else in Nicaragua. And he ended up in prison. And several years after he got out of prison, he came back, and he came back to, uh, to where our New Hope Center is. And Raul went and got me out of the office, and he said, hey, Chepi's here. And I hadn't seen him for years. And uh, he was very skinny, and uh, I'm not sure why he came up there. I don't even know how he found out about it. But he showed up, and Raul, I remember Raul's question to me was, what do we do? And I said, we give him another chance. So second part, I think what we have to realize, we have to rely on God to work through us. We can't do it. You know, it would have been easier for me to say, you know, nice to see you, adios. But if we allow God to work in us and through us, we begin to be able to use his compassion. I, I know we, I've probably been burned by people more in my life than most of people, you know. And, and as you're a missionary and you think, well, do I, what do I do now? I've, they just, it's not my responsibility how they respond. I've learned. I just keep loving them because God loved me. And so Chepe came back to, to uh, our new, our, our center campus, and I told Raul, I said, we're going to make him the security guard. It had not made no sense at all because he stole more stuff, given, and, you know, help people steal. And Chepe slept for two years, for two, at least a year and a half to up to two years, he slept in the bathroom. We had this outside bathroom, and that's where he slept. He had a little cot, and he slept there. This lady met Chepe, and she wanted to build him a house. And I said, okay, let's build him a house. 
and we built this house. So as we look at this second video, I want you to notice something that happens in the video. I'm going to see if you catch it. But there's something, as I'm speaking in this video, you see it hit Chepe. See if you can see what it is. I'm with Chepe. We're inside his brand new house. He was able to uh, receive this house through people who donated for him to have a house and we built this, finished it just a few months ago. Uh, he is 20 years old. He came back to the Hope Project several years ago after being away and we were able to work with him. He's now our security guard, watches our property and he lives here in his new, brand new house. Chepe about 11 years ago uh, in Sol Maria. He was a 10 year old boy uh, who had just lost his mother to cancer. And uh, he was a terror. He would run up and hit me in the back of the head and take off running. Uh, we had a, a night where we were showing videos and he would run in and pull the chair out from the little girls. He was always doing something to get my attention. And I didn't realize it was because his family didn't really want him. And he shared with us several years ago that, that when his mom died, that he lost everything because at least with her, he had someone that loved him. And so we had a vacation Bible school right after that. And he, Chepe gave his life to the Lord and there was an immediate change. He showed up at eight o'clock the next morning dressed in the best clothes he had. He had his shirt buttoned all the way up to the top of his neck. And I said, what are you doing here? And he said, I came to clean the church and get set up for vacation Bible school. Years after that, he uh, got with the wrong crowd and started uh, using drugs and ended up in prison. And uh, he stole uh, tools from us and, and, uh, and just was uh, going down the wrong direction. And two and a half years ago, he came back to us here at this property and Raul, I remember Raul looking at me and he said, well, what do we do with it? I said, we give him another chance because God's given me many chances in my life. And so I talked to Chepi that day. I told him that God forgives sin and that he didn't have to, he didn't have to live like he was living and that God would forgive him. And so that day I told him it's easy. He could do it himself. And Several days later when he came back, he was a different person. And so we're just thankful that, you know, for two years, the last two years, he slept on the floor out here, slept in the bathroom on the floor, and he was our security guard. And so we had a, a donor wanted, that wanted to build him a house, and, and they gave the money, and we were able to build this, this new house for him. And, and uh, he is going to school. He's learning to read and write. and. Uh, he has just turned his life around and is living for the Lord. He comes to church on Sunday, and you can definitely see a change in Chepi's life. You can see it. You can see it in the video. When he realized that God forgave him. He didn't have to carry that guilt any longer. You could see what happened, you know. That's the power of the gospel. And it, and it can be shown through the way we live our lives. We don't have to go out with Bibles and be professional. I know people tell me, well, I can't witness to people. No, you don't have to. Live it out. Show compassion. Um, we can rely on God to work through us. And then to realize that it's God that sent us, right? God has called each of us to go and take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. You know what? He didn't call, he didn't call us to make converts. 
He didn't say go out and convert people. He said go out and make what? Disciples. That means you have to get your hands dirty. That means you have to pour into people and love them when they're not lovable. You have to walk through with them in some of the most difficult circumstances in their life. That's what making disciples is. And we can do that if we'll allow God to work through us and realize that God is the one who sent us. I'm going to wrap this up just by a challenge for each of us as we live out 2024. Let's not get wrapped up in all the, 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 the hype, right? Let's just walk out the gospel. Let's share the love of Jesus Christ with a world who is seeking hope. They want hope in their life. And they're trying, so many people are trying everything but the answer. And the answer is Jesus. That he loves us, he wants to forgive us of our sins, and he wants to give us a hope for eternity. Let's be that, our, our purpose in 2024. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be here today. And God, we thank you for just the examples we've been able to watch of how you've transformed a life. And God, I pray that we will realize that the, the gospel, the power of the gospel has to be shared. That God, you will do the work in us. We don't have to do it on our own. And that you have sent us for a purpose. So God, as we live out this next year, let us live on purpose. Let us love people unconditionally. And let's Reach the world for you, Lord. Give us the strength, the courage, the ability to do that. And we'll give you the glory for what happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.